Good evening. And welcome to the Lakewood Public Library. My name is James Crawford, and I'm the director. Uh, tonight, we're going to be celebrating the life and the poetry of Daniel Thompson. A number of his friends are here. A number of poets who have been influenced by his work are here. Uh, and also here is Mr. Kenneth Warren, my predecessor, who had been director of the Lakewood Public Library. And we're very pleased to have him back. Um, and at this point, I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Warren. Thank you, Jim. And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words of this prophecy are closed and sealed up until the time of the end, when many shall be purified and made white by trial. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. It's from the book of Daniel. It's a pleasure to be here tonight, because what I'd like to do uh, is to set up uh, an appreciation for the rich assembly of people that are here tonight. Daniel Thompson uh, is really an exemplar of the white radical man in America who stands for racial equality and whose poems are moved by that conviction of love and justice and unity. Daniel Thompson stands in a very rich tradition between Cleveland, Kent, and the South. When Horace Greeley counseled, go west, young man, the west that he was talking about was the west of Kansas, where abolitionists were fighting for a free state against slavery. Daniel Thompson, in 1960, 1961, stands between that bridge of the 19th century and the 20th century, a lineage of radical, prophetic poets dedicated to justice and dedicated to love. And this tradition, Cleveland, Kent, Ohio, the battleground state, the place where North meets South, is part of a living, breathing, pulsating history that remains alive in the written word that we will hear tonight as we celebrate the publication of this terrific book. With us tonight, uh, we have many poets and persons who have known and loved Daniel. And what we want to do is give everyone a chance to participate and join in the conversation and celebration tapping into memory, uh, reading from poetry, and appreciating just a little bit better this extraordinary man whose commitment to justice and poetry stands here tonight in Lakewood Public Library, where we celebrated Daniel's poetry on many a Saturday evening with great programs, uh, great variety shows that were curated by uh, Sam Phillips, uh, the King of the Hand Snappers, and uh, there were nights that were unforgettable uh, on Saturday nights in Lakewood Public Library that we shared with Daniel, and I'm, I'm sure several of you uh, were here in the crowd those evenings. So let me begin by introducing a terrific poet from Kent, Ohio, who grew up in Illinois, uh, Major Reagan. And Mage is part of this great Midwestern uh, tradition of poetry that, uh, that spans Ohio uh, to Kansas through Illinois. And we're going to begin with Mage. And uh, Mage edited the book, and he's a friend of, uh, of Daniel's, and he's going to give us uh, a reading of some poems and some reminiscences of the man. Mage, my pleasure. I just got out of the car about seven minutes ago. Um, I didn't think I'd be up here alone, but uh, I know I'm not, in, in fact. Um, yeah, the, the, um, I met Daniel Thompson 
in the mid 80s at a reading in um, Kent. Um, it was a crowded bar, Walter's Cafe, it was called, though no food was served. And um, Daniel was reading his fruits and vegetables uh, poem, and I, and he read above a drunken Friday throng of a hundred people, and still he was somehow heard as he shouted out his poem, and um, then met him again at a place called JB's, and we read together that night and formed something underneath the language that has endured uh, this to this day. And I, I, I think that I, I, Daniel's poems, for me, represent acts of generosity and acts of friendship uh, in what I called in the introduction after Robert Frost's phrase, a lover's quarrel with the world and with Comeback City. Um, Daniel was, was in Kent. He was a lot of places, was all over the country, and yet Cleveland really was the heart of, its all, of it all. That's where he staked down his heart and his, his, uh, his poetry. Um, I went up to uh, Bill Kennedy and I went to the grave last week um, and uh, I looked at the stone for a long time stone with the words inscribed from Daniel's poem even the broken letters of the heart spell earth and um, and I thought of the somber finality of the grave and but I also thought about the way in which Daniel's poetry somehow outlives his death and is free now uh, to travel through time to be to be alive for so many readers who know him but also readers yet unborn there's something beautiful about language and uh, its relation to uh, to death the way in which it outlives it so Daniel's poems I assume a lot of a lot of people will read um, his work. I, one poem um, I've always loved of Daniel's is called Simply Words. And if you know Daniel's work at all, you've heard this one. Those in power always want those in poverty to live on poetry. The best things in life are free, they're fond of saying. Of course, if you help yourself to what's Second best, they lock you up. And if you tell them all you wanted was just a little bit more on your plate, they'll hit you with man shall not live by bread alone. They certainly don't. They've got the bread and the gravy, the meat and the potatoes, the army and the air force, the marines and the navy. And what have we got? Our loneliness and our need to break bread. For that sound breaks the silence between us and out of that broken silence tumbles everything, a cornucopia of words to feed the heart, night words that arise and fall, which each breath, each shadow, words as light as light, whose wings brush against us, and we are never the same, words that are famous with only four letters, like food, love, home sing. And that poem for me contains much of what, uh, what runs through Daniel's poetry. And this is for Daniel. Um, I wrote it on his uh, 69th birthday at the Algebra Tea House. We held a party and a birthday cake. And Daniel was um, staggering um, out of the beginnings of his last uh, chemo treatments. And he uh, showed up um, to the tea house and uh, directly from the hospital and uh, people broke into applause when he came in the door and uh, one hand, two, three, four, dozens and applauded him as he uh, uh, he came in the door and uh, spent the evening with us and had a quip and an act of kindness for everyone who read. And poem for Daniel Thompson's last 
birthday is 69th, April the 21st, 2004. 69 bad monkeys bouncing on a bed. They all fell off, and each one said, where has he gone, that big booger Daniel? 69 black-hatted preachers with corks in their butts all popped off outside Hell's Kitchen and grimaced. Who's going to save her hides now, Daniel? 69 bald-faced liars coughed up the asphalt phlegm of truth, cleared their throats and begged, we want a last word with the man who spoke his heart, Daniel. 69 broken-hearted exotic dancers slid down their brass poles, shucked off their G-strings, and hung them all over that evergreen man named Daniel. 69 big-footed orphans with shining ocean eyes danced a daisy chain round and round dizzy-headed Daniel. 69 heavy-handed drummers pounded out love's old sweet song on the unlocked treasure chest of Daniel. 69 hungry lions in the stone floor den rough-tongued and rasped but did not chomp that big twinkle-eyed ambone named Daniel. 69 firecrackers, lady fingers, black cats hidden in his pants pockets while he slept all went off at once at the stroke of midnight's match. Snap, crackle, and pop got the lowdown on Daniel. 69 golden Sundance eagles snatched away every Wahoo baseball hat off of every head in Jacob's Field bleachers and dropped them one by one, floating down over wounded knee, red and blue flowers wilting on that killing field. 69 brown wrens, little friends of St. Francis nestled in Daniel's beard, tiny Buddha birds chirping, awake, awake, Daniel. The great galleon is dragging its anchor overhead through the clouds, dragging that anchor across your Lincoln street yard. Daniel, catch hold, catch hold. This is the bright morning when we fly away, Daniel. 69 shot glasses brim full with tears, Hart Crane tears, Steve Melton tears, Jenny Dunn tears, Marv Smith tears, homeless tears, workhouse tears, freedom rider tears, freedom train tears, coal train tears, one train headlight in the dark tunnel, coal black tears of train, 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 the last train out of Cleveland, carrying away Daniel. For Daniel, we had a, a year after he died, we uh, held a fundraiser for his headstone. And um, this poem was for that night, Stone Song, Dollars in the Jar, Raising Money for Daniel's Gravestone at the Algebra Tea House, February 12th, 2005, Stone Song. A stone tablet, chiseled name, 1935, 2004, the final page unturned, a stone slicked with cold rain, pointing the way. A stone bare knuckle in the city father's boneyard. A stone porch light welcoming back the wanderer, the front door unlatched. A stone moon circling our years, waxing, waning, setting. A stone poem, broken haiku, scattered letters, silent drums. A stone accordion, busted bellows, too heavy for one man. A stone for Daniel's slingshot against the giant, always against the giant. A stone anchor, 
cut rope the boat adrift on the ebb tide. A worry stone worn smooth by an unseen thumb. A stone for the black iron soup kettle to feed the street sleepers Daniel loved. A stone tulip rusted brown in a garden of gray stones. A stone heart that beats once every year, daybreak, death break on May the 6th. A stone upon which to sharpen grief, that silver blade to a sliver, then gone. A stone in the Lakeview Cemetery, Stonehenge, keeper of the solstice. A stone talisman teaching us to live without fear. A stone lantern burning in deep midnight's belly. A stone marking the last stop for the freedom rider. A stone for the home to which all homeless come. A stone for Daniel. So every, uh, every life is uh, unaccountable, and um, the record of that life is um, Daniel left behind, and it's, and it's here. And there are many others um, to speak for and about Daniel. I thank you. Smith uh, to uh, please come and speak. Uh, when we come to appreciate the place of Ohio and rebel poets, uh, there's a man who has rendered incredible service to that lineage, and that man is Larry Smith. Larry is the publisher of Bottom Dog Press. Uh, he's uh, a poet. Uh, he's written books of fiction. Uh, he's written two terrific biographies, one of Kenneth Patchen, another of Lawrence Ferlin Getty. Uh, he's co-produced uh, three films, uh, one on D.A. Levy, uh, the Cleveland poet, another on James Wright, and another on Kenneth Patchen. Uh, so Larry Smith is uh, a man whose service to the poetic lineage of our state is immense, and it is a deep, deep honor uh, to bring Larry to the podium of Lakewood Public Library. And I'm hoping Larry will talk a little bit about uh, Daniel's work as a freedom writer, that, that the whole history of, uh, of, of, of Daniel's involvement and that shift from the Beat era into the Civil Rights era, hitchhiking to the South, going to Morgan State as a student from Kent State University to show solidarity with black American students there, uh, ending up being arrested in Parchment Farm. I mean, the history that uh, Daniel lived uh, in the early 60s is an incredible uh, piece of the fire uh, that is part of the, the baptism that's contained in the book that is for sale uh, this evening. Larry? Thanks. See, I, I want to meet this guy you were just introducing. It sounded like a... It's all that stuff I care about, you know, and have cared about for 25 more years. Uh, and it is an honor to be part of this gathering, because this is a gathering, you know. And you never know how many people are going to show up or who's going to show up. And look, look who's, who's here and around you. And I always feel when I'm in a gathering, there's hope, you know. There's hope for the world. There's hope for all of us in a gathering. And I'm going to read a poem by Danos right off, and then I'll say some things. And... Uh, because it kind of fits with what you're saying. If you knew Daniel, you knew he would probably be out and doing something, and he'd be livening up this place here too, wouldn't he? This is called, If I Had Wings. If I had wings, I'd fly after nightfall to the heart of the city, to the darkest part of poverty. There out in the open under bright lights, those steamy places where the homeless sleep, night after night. If I had wings, ribs, Pizza, donuts, bagels, pastries, and simply water. I'd get it together, whatever the weather. If I had wings, I'd spread them out, along with these other things, against the night hunger, 
for a feast in the belly of the beast. If I had wings, this would be my latitude, longitude, attitude, altitude, and attitude. If I had wings. Daniel Thompson. He did have wings, I think. He had a way of making things happen. Honest. Yeah, as we did two books. Uh, the first book was a book of poetry and jazz uh, called Even the Broken Letters of the Heart Spell Earth. What a great title. And, uh, and we started publishing that book, and pretty soon I realized that Daniel was publishing that book, and I was just trying to make it all happen and, and, and tuck in the ends because he had a way of managing things, you know, and getting things done, too. Um, there's another poet that reminds me of him in a way, and that's a poet from uh, Wisconsin named Antler. Do you know the poet Antler? That's what he goes by, Antler. And his uh, book of poems is called Last Words. Now, he's still very much alive, and that book came out 20 years ago, but he wanted to call a book Last Words because he felt people pay attention when you call it your last words, you know. These are his last words, and we listen up. Well, these are Daniel's last words. And he paid a lot of attention to putting it together and getting it right and passed it on to Mage through Barbara, and there it was in a box. And it had an order already established by Daniel. So he had that sense of uh, the work mattered and the work lived on. And the, the poets I've worked with, whether they're from Cleveland or from elsewhere, uh, have all been poets, I think, of rebel poets, engaged poets, poets who felt the poetry was supposed to make a difference in people's lives. It's nice to write pretty things, but it's also good just to confront things and to engage things. And Daniel was a champion of that. And he did it with humor. He got away with a lot of the stuff he did because he had that sense of humor and knew how to ride that and to make things happen that way. Um, I think that's all I have to say. I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have more to say about his uh, background as a freedom writer. Uh, when Mage and Jim Lang gave us those pictures of Daniel, I said, well, where's Daniel in this picture? And he said, that's Daniel, you know, 1960, 1961, this trim guy uh, down there working with the freedom writers. So, you know, he's given us a model of somebody who really cares and somebody who made a difference with poetry, so... Uh, I would appreciate it if you take the book home with you tonight. You know, I'm making it as easy as possible uh, for you to do that. So we have them at the back of the room, and thanks for coming tonight. Is Barbara Klonowski here tonight? Barbara, uh, would you like to say anything tonight? No? Okay. Okay. Uh, what I would like to do is, uh, a friend of mine uh, is Tom Grace, who's a historian. And I, I feel that it is, uh, and I, he was unable to come tonight. Uh, Tom uh, was also one of the students uh, shot in the Kent State Massacre. And Tom wrote his dissertation on the history of radical politics uh, from Kent State University. And in his dissertation, there's a fabulous chapter that... Uh, includes quite a bit of material about Danny Thompson. And uh, we're going to, this time, I want to use this to set up uh, Jim Lang's uh, photo montage, and then we're going to do some more image conjuring uh, of Daniel. But in 1961, Daniel was a junior in college, and he went to Baltimore uh, to join African-American students at Morgan State in their anti-discrimination protests. He came back to Kent and uh, submitted uh, an acerbic poem to the Kent Quarterly. And in that poem he wrote, if it's not always the land of the free, at least sometimes it's the home of the brave. Daniel liked to say that he hitchhiked his way into the movement. He was involved in CORE, uh, the Congress on Racial Equality. Uh, he went to Nashville uh, for the protests there and uh, he was determined to head to Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, but he was rejected uh, because he lacked discipline. Uh, and the group didn't feel comfortable with him. So it's, it's interesting to kind of get a, a sense of the young man, his political engagement. Uh, he went... Uh, not only to Nashville, but uh, he went to Monroe, North Carolina, where 
um, things were even hotter uh, than in Nashville. Uh, he was involved with uh, the radical NAACP branch president, uh, Lawrence Williams, uh, in, his, uh, def in, in Williams' defense of two African-American boys who were aged 8 and 10 who had been jailed in 1958 for kissing two white playmates. This was called the kissing case, and it gained international notoriety. James Foreman and Paul Brooks, uh, two veterans of the Freedom Ride, went to Monroe to meet Williams, and they were looking for more uh, uh, white uh, protesters uh, to join in the effort. And uh, Daniel Thompson went uh, to Monroe. Uh, Daniel Thompson spent time in Parchment Farm. He was arrested. Uh, so there's an incredible uh, connection to the civil rights movement, to Kent, uh, to John Brown, to abolitionists, to Emerson, Thoreau, Blake. That whole lineage of revolutionary poetry was in our midst. And I think it's important to kind of understand Daniel's place within that continuum, uh, the flow of poetry, and our relationship uh, in Ohio uh, to the Civil War, uh, to a Civil War that's still going on uh, as we battle for our freedom against life on the corporate plantation. So uh, we're going to move to Jim Lang. And uh, Jim is going to give us a little bit of commentary on some photographs. And then after Jim, Ben uh, Burdick will uh, give us uh, some film footage. And uh, then we're going to move the conversation uh, to really kind of a round robin. Uh, anyone that uh, wants to ascend to the podium, uh, we've got uh, Bill Kennedy uh, here. Uh, Suzanne DiGitano. Suzanne is here. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll work it out uh, for the rest of the night. But right now we've got uh, Jim Lang commenting on his photographs. Thanks to uh, Frankie, in 1973 I was living in Columbus, and I came up to, uh, came up to Cleveland to uh, the Shire. And uh, Frankie was running a lot of readings out of there. And I heard the most amazing voice I'd heard in my life as a poet. It was Daniel reading. And I never do this as a fan or as a groupie. I walked up to him afterwards. I said, would you read some more? And so he got up and he read some more. The first one, this is toward the end, but the first one was in 1975. He was wandering through the Cleveland Public Library. And I, I took his picture. Part of my game was I thought this stuff was going away. It was quite fugitive. Now with everybody with their cell phone and a half and <laughs> photographed right there, it's actually changed the, the game. I gave a talk out at work about the, the mnemonics of digital photography. And uh, it's more of a mnemonic than it ever was. I could shoot in the dark. I had all kinds of technique. And I could make pictures that I thought were important to uh, bring back. The sky is blue. Happy as our beast, we arrive home. The war is over. Our enemies have taken and fallen from high places. The rent is paid. We're nobody's fool. We can take the happiness. We can handle. We know behind the tree, between the buildings, in the doorway on the beat, a peace officer waits, ready to wage war, to bust us again. For jaywalking, you got me. I'll say, don't bother to check, officer. I admit it. From an early age, yeah, a record of disorderly convictions. Of, I know you, he'll say. You're the poet. The sky is blue. Fuck you. Wonderful Daniel poem. And what's interesting to me, I'm not sure about publishing. I'm not sure about record keeping. I'm not sure about making photos. But I've turned Daniel's words onto a, a bunch of young people, and they pick up on it because there's heat in there, whatever way it's done. And I was riding a bus the other day. I'm doing a series of things called uh, Tales of the Regional Transit. And this came out of Ben Gulyash and his dad. Man down! 
because someone I know trod it down more than once. There is a pathway I could walk to the front of the bus and hold out my hand. Need it? I asked. A man down, daily, did a silent slow-mo back limbo from the floor to his seat, as he does when no one else is there to witness. I walked back to my seat in the back with a stink deep enough in my nose and gut to evoke dear dead Daniel, who drove a man down from the homeless street to the ER many more than once. And years of open window and rain couldn't blow that inhuman, humanitarian death smell from his passenger seat cushion. I blew my nose over and over and hard and went on to my job with a little invisible street cred and weariness. Daniel's still here. What I hear, I can't remember. What I see, I'll soon forget. When you show me with your hands like that, you know I'll never quit. Because to learn is a thing of beauty. Once you know, it becomes your duty. To do a thing right every time, please do it quick. Oh, do it quick, because to learn is a genuine diamond, Daniel. With the hardness I'm finding, hard to forget. With my hands in a fist, I can't take your gifts. Please, teacher, won't you school me? Please don't be cruel to me. So much is new to me, all I know is what I see. I can't remember what I hear I might forget. Daniel, your death smashes our clock, the cold nose of morning and the evening walk. Praise waters that flow through our eyes, through the park. Praise fires that glow in the heart of the dark. Praise winds that blow our ashes, our love to the earth underfoot. To the skies above, O oh, gutter moon, chrome blood. Animal grief, I must woo the broken voice. Hanging on the wire, Raz's poem by Daniel. First time I met Daniel, I was walking a couple blocks from my house with two friends for whom I felt totally liable. They were both crazy. One was Bob. I made the mistake of pointing out Daniel to Bob when I spotted him down the road from us, walking his Sheltie. I erringly told my two friends Daniel was our poet laureate. Bob goes crazy, chases after Daniel, starts telling him how we all three kids are poets. While Bob talks to the old man, Mick and I hang back, embarrassed that I have any part in wasting his time. Bob comes back looking defeated. He wasn't very nice, Bob said. He was mean to you? I was shocked. He was mean about poets in general, Bob told me. <laughs> Daniel supposedly told Bob we kids should give it up now, get a good job and education if we hadn't yet, and pursue college. That's crazy, I told Bob and Mick. My whole life I knew I would be a poet and support myself as a worker somehow. Writing was the only thing that meant something to me and the thing that made me slavish in my pursuits in general. When we got back to my house, Mick lit a bowl, and I got my big dick, a four-volume leather-bound set. I looked up laureate and read aloud the definition. Then we got drunk. When the wine was gone, I kicked the boys out, and alone as my house got dark, I wrote a term paper about what laureate is and is meant to stand for, representing and bringing poetry, in this case, into the community so that it's enmeshed in the public itself, honoring the poem, promoting local poets, both the establishments and the not yets, through word of mouth and by rallying behind them at reads, patronizing local presses and bookstores, befriending folks at libraries and coffee shops. And here he was telling us, turn back. 
And here he was, a black from my own house, telling a friend of mine to forget words. So I kind of didn't like him. But he ended up liking me behind my back. Next thing you know, he kept appearing places, places I worked or hung out. And he was really nosy about my press, the books I made. He didn't have a computer. He was not on my email list. But somehow, when I put out word that I was seeking submissions, Daniel would be first to hand me palms. He just appeared, holding a long stack of manila paper palms. I'd pick two poems from the stack, and Daniel would say, let me see which ones you picked. And he'd say, oh, figures, or of course you like those. (laughs) And I'd say, why, how did you know? And he'd say, because you're enigmatic, you like the oblique. And since he was a persistent guy, and I really wanted to use his poems, I gave him a chance. Ended up taking truck with him. Turns out he may have been wisecracking, turning my boys and I off our poems. He must have been jiving, because not only did Daniel support poets and bookstores, he had a hospital filled with adoring nurses he'd turned on to Posey. He turned on councilmen. I learned he spent plenty of time in shelters and prisons, getting lawyers and mayors, homeless and folks with their heads too filled to make much sense in the same seats, in the same auditorium, the streets, the backyard barbecues, the taverns, the churches. He gave homecoming, service hours, Ambition to paint one's house and hone one's life's work, poetry. What the fuck did he do for a living, my husband always wanted to know. I don't know, I'd say. He has drivers, secretaries. He's friends with everyone we know. The good eggs and the bad. He gets by. And being the kid, the dreamer, the fool, I believe in my heart, poetry drove him. Poetry kept him fed and amused. That man's life's work was poetry even when no words came and he couldn't write. Poetry answered his phone and changed the sheets on his bed at night. And it is the same poetry which gives us pluck enough to keep it up, two, three, four. And to those rainy day prophets who say again, what does it profit a nation to gain the whole world and lose its own soul? I say, whose side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? Suicide or genocide? Come on, boys you got to decide. Suicide or genocide, come on, boys. you got to decide. Come on, boys, let's roll. Tear it up, two, three, four. Hup, two, three, four. Hup, two, three, four. Tear it up. Tear it up. Tear it up. at Nighttown with Daniel's Rain Poet. And uh, Daniel showed up, I brought my son there. Daniel used to come over to my house in Lakewood and try to set it up as a homeless shelter. <laughs> <laughs> he realized I had something else going on. We'd play little street ball and I would feed him and he and my son would play chess. And we went to Nighttown 20 years later and uh, Daniel walked in and my son walked in. Daniel looked at him and said, I want a rematch. (laughs) Rachel Lindsay wrote on a piece of cardboard so I would find it. Well, anyone would find it if they were looking in the right place. I think Daniel often looked in the right place, sometimes at the wrong time. When we were headed back from Chicago, and we were driving through Clyde, Ohio, which was the uh, setting for Winesburg, Ohio. On Route 6, there was a sign which stood for years, home to Sherwood Anderson's Winesburg, Ohio. When we came through, somehow it had finally falling on the grass to the side of the road and Daniel was sorely tempted to stop and I was even slightly more sorely tempted to stop and snag it and put it in the trunk of the car and take it back with us and we pulled on to the side of the road and we debated for about mm, three minutes and 15 seconds 
but he chickened out in, in a wise way, I suppose. He didn't want to get busted. And I coalesced, <laughs> which is probably the wrong word. But anyhow, we, uh, we agreed that it wasn't the right thing to do at that time, even though it was like standing there, a piece of history, and would have come back with us, and how wonderful, but uh, we let it go. Rachel Lindsay was a poet who, uh, in that same tradition of midriff, midwest, walk around and uh, try to reach out to people and plead your case, wrote this poem called The Leaden Eyed. Let not young souls be smothered out before they do quaint deeds and fully flaunt their pride. It is the world's one crime. Its poor are ox-like, limp, and leaden-eyed. Not that they starve, but they starve so dreamlessly. Not that they sow, but they seldom reap. Not that they serve, for they have no gods to serve. Not that they die, but they die like sheep. What the hell are we doing here? That's not what Daniel would ask. That's just what I asked. And I cannot speak for Daniel. Though I have sublimed with him on eternal corners, a full half step behind his spontaneous ritual of alms for the lost and the unseen, envisioned yet invisible in the scope of things, driven with a beard of chance, picked hairless as a naked ape, a dog with burning paws. And would this $5,000 gasoline have darkened his cannon more than death itself? Who knows? Of course not. He'd have found alms from some greater largesse that shamed and grinning politic to make a momentary deal might offer a nom de plume to get it done, make it so, make a moment, march alive, with a street preacher's testimonial, a dervish of moths frozen in the moon, leveled down with a tale of who was when and been there too, a side glance wink and chuckle that every puck and flying apple could strive for, strive for that plume, the ink of the hungry weeping star, somehow, somehow shake it off, shake it off, like a sock monkey, shake it off and burn, burn for the pleasure, the chase, the chance to burn, bright and lost, almost a wish, a wish, almost. But then, still echoing, who knows, who knows? Night poem by Daniel. Who threads these silences with weather's fragility, rails against star, feather and tree through the needle's eye? Eyes the pitch of 40 elusive winks in the elephant, scratch that, in the alphabet of night, where eyes shine forth insomnia, the dreamless ego like a shell-shocked snail drags about its own private hell the smell, and then the taste of rain. If only things would happen again, if I, if you, if only I would write again, lightning strikes, a leaf falls, a grief-stricken tree splits apart, resembling this schizoid poet who also barks when pissed on and has now star, bird, wood enough for fiery verse. Daniel. I hope a lot more of the people here can say a few things, but I just wanted to say that um, this book is dedicated to Barbara Klonowski, and, um, you know, there's a reason for that. I think that... Um, it's clear that uh, Daniel was able to do a lot of the things that he did in his life because 
Barbara was in his life. So I wish she would talk about it a little bit. Um, tonight, I think maybe, I don't know if this was mentioned, but tonight there's a benefit for a project called Voices of Homelessness. And um, it's a book project um, for the Lakeside Men's Shelter. So tonight, starting at 8 o'clock at the Harp, down at like 44th in Detroit, it's a whole night of music and poetry. And uh, there's a fee, and that fee goes towards the book, but I think this would be a project that Daniel would want us to all be involved in. So I think we could all head down there, and there's a great band playing down there too. Um, One other thing I wanted to say about Daniel, um, you know, he always had his causes and the things that he was involved in constantly, all the time, and just before he died, at that night at the Algebra Tea House um, that Mage referred to, there was a woman who was visiting from Africa, and she was working on a project where people would donate money and it would buy a cow for the village, and that was his passion, you know, up to the minute he died, he was um, kind of collaring people and asking them to donate for this for this cow. So, uh, I wasn't going to read this particular poem because I don't think I can really do it justice, but Ben is here and Bree is here and uh, Mark Christie is here, and these are all people that uh, go to the Barking Spider Tavern and um, Martin Jardine, who uh, who was a proprietor of the tavern for 25 years. He just recently died, and Daniel had written a poem for him, and uh, it's called Tavern Poem for Martin. In the barking spider dark where angels speak and the old lion echoes the fire's roar, his tale told and told again among the youth. The dead rose, light as the pale moon, the moon's news, yellowed with age. Now all lie together downwind below the fallen, broken sky. Thank you. This seems this seems a lot, a little bit too formal for a Daniel event. I mean, and thanks Ben for reading, and thanks Bree for reading, and I hope everybody else comes up here. Um, I can't say I was a special friend of Daniel. I was a friend of Daniel. Daniel accepted everybody. I was accepted by Daniel. Uh, I was in good company. Um, I first became aware of him back in the late '60s, early '70s when I got involved in the anti-war movement down at Cleveland State, and Daniel was around a lot. He wasn't somebody I really knew then. He was somebody I saw at all of the events I was going to, somebody I knew was active, uh, somebody I knew was committed, somebody I knew whose heart was big and who cared for people. Um, I, it wasn't until later, in the probably in the 80s, when I started reading out in Kent, and then at the Shire at Cleveland State, and at Max Bax, and at the Barking Spider, and those great road trips to Chicago and Cincinnati with uh, Daniel and Katie and Wendy in the back seat. And uh, it was a wonderful time. It was always great to be with Daniel. He always had a great story. He always had a great story about somebody you knew or somebody you wanted to know. And that thing about uh, the chess game, after 20 years, he would say, I want a rematch. Every time he saw Mike O'Malley, who was a reporter for The Plain Dealer and I, who I saw come in, every time he walk, Mike would walk in, he, Danny would go, no comment. <laughs> and, if, and if he was here tonight, he would have done the same thing, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm not talking to the press, right. <laughs> um, anyway, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking. I want to read some of Daniel's poems. And give a little history maybe too, because I do know some of it. This was mentioned. Even the broken letters of the heart spell earth. Even the broken letters of the heart spell earth. Let the heart beat for the trees, their perfection, the ancient rain, the open spaces along the river, the species that are endangered, the tiger burning bright, the flower, the honeybee, the frozen places of silence, the cruel bottom of the sea, the schools of fish made truant, and in the sky, the ozone's wound, and the bird's nest, and the eye that rests on the sparrow. Even the earth, 
of the brokenhearted can heal. In 1995, the um, in International uh, Women's League for Peace and Freedom, there was a big uh, international convention of women in Beijing, in China. And there was a peace train that went from Europe all the way across Asia to Beijing. And there were delegates from the United States on that train going to the convention and then in Cleveland, there's a local chapter, the um, Women Speak Out for Peace and Justice, Women Speak Out for Peace and Freedom. No, the International League, International Women's League for Peace and Freedom, the Cleveland chapter is a Women Speak Out for Peace and Justice. Anyway, there was a great woman who some of you knew, I hope, um, Ione Biggs, who was very active in that organization. Uh, she died in 2005, sadly. Um, but in 2004, in February, Daniel spoke at her a tribute that was held for her, that the organization had for her. And he told the story that in, in 1996, Ione asked Daniel to write a poem for the delegate coming to Cleveland to talk about what had been going on at the the International Women's Convention in Beijing. And Daniel said, yeah, I'll write a poem. And then he ran into Ione at the Hessler Street Fair, and she reminded him that he was going to write her a poem, and the delegate was coming on the following Wednesday, and he hadn't even started writing a poem. So he said he locked himself up and wrote for a few days, and, and he knew it was about a peace train, so he started writing things. He started thinking about everything he could remember about trains and finally put something together. And then at the last minute, he realized, wait a minute, this is the women speak out, and there wasn't a single woman in the poem. So he, he quickly added Harriet Tubman, and he had been thinking of, uh, of a couple other women and added them. And he recited the poem. Everybody loved the poem. Everybody said, don't change that poem. That's a great poem. But I own said, you forgot the A train. So he added the A-train to the poem. So Daniel says he, she gets co-authorship with the poem, uh, with Daniel for this poem. And it's a poem called Train. And Daniel also said he used to, if he needed to, he could always throw a, a woman in the caboose. I know he was being cheeky Daniel, as he always is, trying to get a rise out of the group. But he would, he would, add, he would change the poem, and he would add people. So I'm going to take a liberty and, and add something at the end. This is his poem, Train. Train, you've driven your golden spike into the dark night of my soul. Train, you carry my death in the smoky breath of your cities. Train, you're the iron horse, the ironic force that sped up the nightmare of history, our genocidal mystery. Train, it'll be a great day when this wobbly, depressed hobo poet riding the rods finds you're carrying peace, Train. Mine eyes have been watching you closely, Train. This is now a new freedom train, the new swing low, sweet Harriet Tubman train. No high noon killers on this train. No death nor internment camp counselors on this train. This is no bourgeois train. This is the Woody Guthrie bound for glory train. This is the lead belly train, the A train, the A Philip Randolph Pullman Porter train, the John Cole train, the ain't I a woman sojourner tooth train, the great day in the morning I own bigs women speak out for peace and justice train, the big book of Daniel train, the Daniel Thompson help the homeless work for justice never stop practicing peace train 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 all right um, <clears throat> we have the artist who uh, painted the portrait of Daniel that you see over here and uh, I was wondering if uh, he'd be willing to uh, come up and tell us a little bit about that process. How are you doing? My name is Tim Heron, and I'm far from a poet. I'm an artist. I've known Daniel a long time. I don't know when I met him. Late 80s, early 80s, late 70s, it's all a blur. 
I met him in a very unusual way. I have an artist friend of mine who was a drunk, a poet, and a dishwasher. His name is Robert Ritchie. And uh, he was the farthest thing from a poet who pretended to be a poet. He would go to punk shows, and he would read the outrageous poems that I'd be embarrassed to say right here. I'll be honest with you. And Daniel liked Robert. To, to Robert, Daniel was like a father to him. To, to Daniel, Rob was like a son of a bitch to him. <laughs> and I don't know why it ever happened, but they became close friends. He, Daniel would read these punk events. Nobody would be listening to him. Nobody would care about him. He'd just be speaking to the wind. But he'd show up and he'd do it. Daniel's just an amazing person. You know, like everyone here knows, homeless shelters, battered women, uh, the prisons. Daniel was there. And somehow, as an artist, I got to know Daniel. And over the years, I, I've drawn him about four times. This one here, I, was, I have a weird sense of humor. And in this, he's, wearing, he's holding a remote control. Daniel didn't care. He had, a, he had a tremendous sense of humor. This poem was given to me, and this is the one I, I based this on. But I took liberties with it. Now, I'm, not, I'm not a poet, so please understand, this is not going to sound like a poet's reading. If light were music, or this is titled, If Light Were Music. If light were music, the night earth spinning towards its golden star, and in that turning, the echo of the moon, on the water reveals the killer in the mirror, the shadow breathing hard, whose weight pitches on the shore, not intended there, I'm sure, whose heart of glass reads, in case of emergency, break. If light were language spoken only in tongues by hearts on fire, the wordless eye would sing its blind desire, forgiveness would flow like blood. If light were sound, natural to the ground of all beings, would each creature cross the field to comfort each in the deep dreaming? And I added, if light were remote controls, then you would wear them out. <laughs> One of those paintings Barbara has. Barbara's here somewhere, huh? Okay. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Kim. And it's very unusual, Daniel, because I've never seen him like that. He, he was shaved, he was clean cut, he had a tie, and I had him reading The Manly Hand Guide. <laughs> I own the Manly Pad, an art gallery. And it is, is hysterical because he wouldn't blink an eye, he didn't care. Where do you want me to sit? He'd sit here and read The Manly Hand Guide. <laughs> Which would be insulting for any normal poet, but Daniel had no pretense. That was really superb, Tim. Thank you very much. So now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to kind of open up the melee so uh, you can upload whatever you wish to upload uh, to the stage. And then I figured uh, tonight what we'll do is we'll close it out then with the film. We'll, we'll conjure Daniel at the end and, and give Daniel the last word. I think that'll, that'll work for everybody. Uh, I think that's the way we'll frame it tonight. But uh, we want to make sure that everybody has their shot, uh, whether it's a memory, recollection, poem. Hello, my name is Stephen B. Smith. And uh, Daniel was always an activist. He started the homeless grapevine. So the first thing I want to mention is they are now collecting for the, the Cleveland Street Chronicle, which is the replacement for the homeless grapevine. So if you want to know any information about contributing to the homeless grapevine, which is now the Street Chronicle, you can talk to my wife over there. Oh, there's flyers back there, too. Also, my wife has a petition to be signed for SB5, overturning SB5, which is the, uh, the anti union thing going on. And the third thing is a Blue Sky Folk Festival. This is May 7th. That you can also get information from my wife there. Anyway, from 1986 to 2005, I published over 100 Daniel Thompson poems and art crimes. I think I'm the largest single publisher of Daniel Thompson up until, up until this, of course. Uh, in fact, Daniel and I co-edited two, two issues ourselves, number four and number 12. So I'm going to read my favorite Daniel Thompson poem. 
which is beauty and the bird. Out of loneliness, I have fashioned a bird that does not sing, save when rare occasions bring stark beauty. Then bird and I are one, and we go mad with song and beat our wings, and through imagination's eye we even fancy we can fly beyond the skin of things. Then earth's sad face comes round again, remind us of the cage we're in, and how stark raving mad we've been to think we're saved by beauty. And the last poem he gave me before he died went into Art Crimes 20 and 21, To Sleep and Forget. To sleep and forget the evening sky, the promises of the city, I lie, fallen roses round my bed, white flowers drawn from my sick breath by hand, though no sleight of hand can take away the pain. Take heart, I say, and the heart is taken, its sleight of breath extends the poetry of flesh, returns love to the earth, where the hand, again dreaming, writes in the dust." And I have one I have one poem that mentions Daniel. It's called Steal This Poem. <laughs> Could I steal? I'd take until things move according to themselves by Amy Bracken Sparks. Or Jim Lang's Ice Melts in Only One Direction. Though I'd lift the whole poem if you didn't watch that way. I'd glom Steve Melton's Stevie Gloom. He's dead and would like that, having deeded me Cleveland and Cambodia before he downsized. I'd steal most of Major Reagan's work as life lesson plan. I'd hack Jack Kerouac's strife and time, borrow Burroughs' drugs, swallow Stevens' Elliot. When I recite, I use Bob Dylan's words, sing Leonard Cohen's Everybody Knows in Tom Waits' voice, with Willie Nelson for backup stash and harmony. I'd steal from Daniel Thompson, but he's a laureate, he's a laureate poet, and people would know it. Oh, I'm good at taking things. I have a sense of taste. Thank you very much. Street, it's good to see you here. You have a, a short Daniel vignette. Uh, uh, I was invited to a uh, poetry meeting. This was in the early 80s. Yeah. Uh, all I had was a room number at Cleveland State, and I come from the hinterlands and end up in downtown Cleveland, and I'm standing on a corner trying to figure out not only what building do I go to, but how do I find the, the room number, and a car flies around the corner, and the passenger door flies open, and he says, I bet you're looking for the poetry reading. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't know me from Adam. So I get in, and off we go. So it was synchronicity. <laughs> And uh, my name is Frances Dostel, and um, I had the uh, honor of having um, an, a husband who was in the workhouse, and Daniel lived with me at that time, during the time that my husband was away. Um, and what I remember mostly was that he took steaming hot baths. Um, it, 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 I could not imagine, but he had been at Parchman Prison Farm, and uh, I think because of that experience, he just felt that he had to cleanse himself. And uh, uh, I remember one time... I came, uh, and the bathtub water was boiling hot, and um, I 
added some cold water to it. My mistake. <laughs> Daniel almost had a fit <laughs> and insisted that he had to be um, in boiling hot water. Um, and that's what I remember most about Daniel. I didn't know of him as a poet um, because um, I, I wasn't into uh, poetry. Um, but he did live for, for several months with me um, uh, and uh, I'll never forget him because of that. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Now, if you all had a book in your hands, one of these, you could help me find it. And you should all have a book. Um, it's in the de dedication, it says, for, uh, for Ted and Francis Dostal. Um, we'll find it before the night's out. It, Katie's here somewhere. Katie Daly's going to read? There's a lot of things I miss about Daniel. A lot of people talked about many of those qualities. I think I most miss his impishness. Um, but uh, people were talking about his work in uh, freedom riding and civil rights and one thing I really miss in the poetry community that Daniel was really it was one of his uh, projects was to keep it mixed up um, I forget your name the artist was talking about how Daniel would go to these punk events and Tim, and uh, you know, read to uh, a lot of people weren't even listening. And um, he also made a really concerted effort to mix up the black and the white poets. And he would organize a lot of events. In uh, say he'd go to a black neighborhood, he'd find some black poets. He'd say, "Let's have a reading," and then he'd invite all his white friends and and not tell them that you know. It's in a, it's in the hood, you know, <laughs> and uh, and vice versa. And I, I really uh, I miss that. I mean, I'm looking out, and tonight I see almost all white faces. And if Daniel were here, he would, you know, he'd do something about that. So maybe I should do something about it. <laughs> um, Daniel always seemed, uh, you know, he was so out in the world, and so many people loved him, but I, uh, I always saw him as really lonely, and I think a lot of his poems speak to that. This is Love's Thief. Night is a valentine of sky, wine dark of moon sliced golden, a feast, and I... A thief in moonlight, invited by the wind, move beneath your window, steal away among the trembling shadows of these branches, these leaves. And though I'm alone now and have grown old, mumbling in my beard, I still break for hearts on this dark road still call out in a clear voice your name. Uh, it's a poem for Daniel called Pearl Road. Oh, gone cactus man, crusty loaf of sourdough with the center pulled and eaten. O oh, jagged trail of crumbs from birth to death. We still dig with our bare hands, look for you in the grit under our fingernails, cock our ears to hear your voice, heart of the train whistle, 
drifted. Your words, train whistle of the heart, fallen off. Your heart, not really a heart, more like a pancreas, the pancreas of Cleveland. Your satiric insulin burning off the deal-sweetened politicians and saccharine poets. Oh, poet, come back and agitate this loneliness into a jailbreak or an entire evening of Billy Holiday's twisted rope of a voice flickering, flickering, a good long piss on Rockefeller's grave, a dream machine rusting in the Pearl Road junkyard, your breath huffing down West 2nd Street, tossing husked shells over your shoulder, your voice winking at me, murmuring, the world's your oyster, sister. Take it. Take it. It's yours. What uh, Fran didn't tell you is why Ted was in the workhouse. Uh, he was not a bad man. He was a very good man. Uh, he was in the workhouse, I'm sure. For... Bad men in the workhouse. There are no bad men in the workhouse. That's the truth. Daniel knew that as well. He was there for some activism of some kind, demonstrating against something or other. Uh, he fell afoul of the law, but he was doing the right thing. Um, and we all on the left... Uh, in the movement, I think that's where Daniel knew him from, the movement. We used to call it the movement. It was the civil rights movement. It was the anti-war movement. It was the movement working for change, working for justice. So this is his poem, Super Poem, for Fran and Ted Dostal. Superman, as you know, is really from Cleveland. But why call him the man of steel? He never worked a day in his life in the mill. And now that these plants are closing, along with newspapers like the Daily Planet, where he did work, maybe we should call him the man of rust. But listen, don't worry about Clark Kent coming up with the rent. Just with his eyes, he could get a degree in X-ray technology at Tri-C. No, Superman never worked in the flats of the Margaret Bork White photographs when steel made wealth and the weather of hell with its satanic tale of fire, fire, Lord, fire that burns the soul. But I do know one steely-eyed hell of a worker, the iron man of the left, red Ted to his friends, hostile docile to his enemies, who's more powerful than the locomotive that delivered him from the deep north, locomotive, that is crazy reason, who faster than a speeding bullet can line up people to picket, fire up a crowd, then with it leap like Lenin's over the tall stories, the tall propaganda of the bosses and the tall buildings that defy the sky, not with a single bound, but bound to the collective. Is it a burden? No, it's a plain fact, Jack. We don't need supermen. We need to organize ordinary men, ordinary women, because together we're extraordinary. And Fran... We need a thousand like her, needle in hand. Now there's a thousand points of light to stick it to the capitalists, to needle those butt brains with shots of revolution. In the never-ending battle, our struggle, we need to speak truth, to do justice. But the man of steel, that cold, lying bastard, he's just ice. He's not for real. He spends his day defending the men who steal the American way. Daniel Thompson. And this is uh, one of my poems for Daniel. It takes a Daniel. It takes a Daniel to make a village. Where are you, Daniel? We have your poems, but we miss your heart. That cold train crane that lifted every voice and sang. Oh, Danny boy, the peeps, your peeps are calling. The pipes of Cleveland crawling still with rats. I miss your hats. Your Mickey Cat's pajamas. It happened one night. God free Daniel from the rapture rupture. We are the left behind. The far, far left marks my words. We need your vision. O oh, see, can you say? Of thee I sting. These days there's always something in my eye, and it isn't you. But I always look for the union label. Hey, Mabel, the quarter's for the jukebox. But now I don't feel like singing. 
Years go by without your voice, your glance, not a chance, no more dance around this town again with you. If energy is not created or destroyed, your energy is somewhere. Nothing is the same without you here. This must be the place. I'll call it the afterlife. Um, I used to be a cook, and so Danny was always trying to figure out ways that I could do something for some benefit, and um, somehow it always ended up being a disaster. Uh, does anyone remember, of course, the Junkyard Dog Show on Poetry and Onion and Garlic Fest? So we had about, I don't know, 10 or 15 people over to my house, and I was dispensing the recipe, which was 60 cloves of garlic for six chicken legs. And you can imagine the quantity and the, the pots that we had to use. And it all went off very well. Um, we came up with, I think, three or four huge, almost drums of chicken and garlic stew. The only problem was it was about 90 degrees. And uh, by the time it was time to eat, we realized that that chicken was probably bad. So the entire thing, we couldn't eat it. It was all thrown out. Uh, another time... Um, Allen Ginsberg was coming to town, and he was going to be speaking at the uh, 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 Institute of Art. So I made a huge spread for Allen Ginsberg, who I first met in a bean back in 1967, I think, when uh, he came to read at the, you probably remember, D.A. Levy and uh, Asphodel Bookshop when they were busted by the subversive squad and uh, the, the Fugs and... Uh, uh, Alan Ginsberg came to town. Well, unfortunately, when Alan was coming again, he ended up with emergency surgery for a uh, gallbladder. So once again, the entire evening was a bust, and my food went for nothing. <laughs> so those are my two stories that every time I think about Dan, I want to have to think. And then one other thing was I had a, always had a hard time with our food co-op here in Cleveland because I could never remember to bring my co-op, co-op card. And people would get very angry with me, and I, being a little oppositional, always found it kind of ridiculous, since I was one of the 13 people who started it when it was on Hessler Street. So it became really, I didn't forget it, I just didn't bring it. And one time, uh, uh, Danny happened to be in line, uh, in another line, and so the woman told me that I wasn't able to buy the food today because I didn't have my co-op card, and Danny met me as I was walking out the door and said, your co-op card, don't leave home without it. Uh, I think the first poetry reading I ever went to, I met, uh, was set up by Daniel. So and he did that a lot in town. Uh, it was uh, at, everywhere he went, he seemed to set something up and disappear. Uh, I wrote one poem for him, and I'll see what's going on here. This this one is by him. I heard him claim it was after a quotation by Thomas Jefferson, We Are All Gunmen. I tried to find that quotation, but I, I could never find it. <laughs> Cross at the light and step over the dead. We are all gunmen. After the trial, the judge said, Daniel, you can say anything you want to in America, but you've got to pay for it. We are all gunmen. I heard it at the seesaw, the time the angels trashed my reading. After the poets will come the tears, drink the beers. We are all gunmen. How many killers are out tonight? How many are threatening your life? We are all gunmen. We are all gunmen. Let's put the L back in flag, Anita Bryant. What do you need? You're it in the game of nuclear tag. Hey, hey, Enola Gay. How many buttholes did you bomb today? We are all gunmen. We are all gunmen. We're big brains. We're scientists. We got grants to prove it. Star Wars shit. Let's knock the monkey brain out. This planet of the apes can go to hell. We need better helmets for the FNFL. The whole country can go on the dole. We're going to meet Russia in that big Super Bowl. We're all gunmen. We are all gunmen. We are all gunmen. Cross at the light and step over the dead. We are all gunmen. Uh, this one doesn't have a title. I wrote it for, uh, 
for Daniel. To know that beard is to wear it like dust wears the sunshine between us, landing nowhere very long, lonely and naked in the heart of the crowd of voices, the circle unbroken of the common man surrounding himself with bread and dignity, where both had once been in opposition, now they are manna and manner, not master and slave, public refugees and private commodities, subtle iniquities in the passenger seat. And the last poem is his, The Anatomy of Love. Uh, when love, excuse me, when love comes out the window, the law goes in the door. They want to know, what was that sound? Love, he says, she said, all the way down. He lies, Saad says, I fear foul play. Love's love was a rope of sand, and that was the wrong way, Corrigan replies, to let the love light in her eyes. We charged love with a felony. I disagree, John T., says love's attorney. Love's love was grand. It just got out of hand. Why, Dave was Adam, Virginia, Eve, their only sin, originality. She dangled like forbidden fruit three stories high, and then she fell, and then she died. For what shall love be tried? I suppose if I'd been love, I'd have kept that window closed. But who knows? When love goes out the window, the law comes in the door. They know it when they hear that sound. Love. He cries, she cried, all the way down. Thanks. class given by uh, Matabu Okanta. Uh, and uh, so for about a week, Daniel would show up in his coveralls, and I, I didn't know what he was talking about. I didn't know much about poetry. I, I don't think you can learn a lot about poetry in a poetry class. Um, <clears throat> I met him again at a house party, and uh, he told me a story uh, out of the blue. He said, you know, I only stole one thing in my life. And maybe you folks that know him really well, he told me he stole a tomato once, and that's the only thing he ever stole. Could that be true? <clears throat> I, he borrowed, maybe. <clears throat> okay. So, um, But there was one time at the Cleveland Art Museum, they had a fundraiser, and it was going to have, um, <clears throat> it was about the beat generation. And it was $50 a ticket, and they wanted the people that bought tickets to, to dress up in berets and black clothes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and they had little cafe tables spread out all around the, uh, uh, the lobby area of the uh, museum. And they uh, asked Daniel to come and read poetry. And uh, Daniel and, and Daniel, a couple of us went along with Daniel, and Daniel had his reams of paper to pass out some of his poems. And he started reading, <clears throat> and the people running the program wanted him to like not read so loud, <laughs> that he was just supposed to be a prop, sort of like a like a doppelganger of a poet, like not the real thing, just just an icon off mumbling somewhere. And we all, we couldn't believe it. It was this, this reality. That, I mean, it's really real that they just wanted somebody to look and sound like a poet, but they didn't want to hear his words. And um, I don't, if there is an us and them, that, that really pointed out an us and them to me in my life. And, uh, and Daniel, Daniel was... Daniel knew that existed a long time ago, but that was very real for me that day. So, anyways, uh, I, I really love Daniel. So. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bill. I'm a friend of Daniel's. I knew Daniel from the 60s, and uh, I really wasn't into the literary crowd and that, but we used to hang out in the same places when the hippie movement started. You know, I met him when he was a beatnik. He, I remember him coming into town. <clears throat> he had a Bible in one hand, 
and uh, wine on the other hand. And he said, take your choice. Which one do you want? You know, and <laughs> he was always doing cool things, and I always knew he was, you know, uh, I mean, he was just amazing. Uh, you know, even if people know, that know him, I mean, he... He had this photograph when they blew up the uh, image in front of the art museum with the thinker. We had a picture of himself there with a little sign and a, cu- a cup so you can hire the handicapped. You know, I mean, it just, he was one of a kind. And uh, I, I just learned that he died when uh, he was 69. I'm 69 now. And I'm just getting into poetry. I'm just starting to, you know, I got into his poetry. I mean, I got one-on-one poetry readings from him, you know. But, um, yeah, he cornered me one day. I was down selling Cleveland Indians uh, merchandise. at the, uh, So I got all my chief Wahoo hats and all this stuff outside, you know. And, he's, and he read me that poem, you know. I, I had a different take on the Wahoo, you know. I, that was just one great, great poem. You know what I mean? I, you know, and uh, but actually, Daniel was one of the people. He made Cleveland better. You know, he. You know, when I'm 69 now, the same age as Daniel was when he left. And but when I grow up, I want to be more like Daniel. That's what I gotta say. Thanks. Okay, this has been a really beautiful evening, and we're going to give Daniel the last word tonight. The sky is red. The sky is a mirror over the bleeding, dying city. But we are alive in the once in the blue moon, moon, ready to move, and that's the crime. Soon blue down under life in L.A., living close to the bone and the nerves ganglia. When she and her son Navarro lived for months in their car, told me during a visit with her breathless mother, Daniel, if I had to live in Cleveland, I'd become a criminal. Tonight's the moon. Tonight the moon is blue. Anarchy's in the air. It's a crime to breathe. There's an all points bulletin and all moonlight conspirators. I drive a getaway car. We're riding the crest of a crime wave, a wave of emotion, crimes of the heart, crimes of passion in the night season. You. You're as cool as roses there in the suicide seat as we speed out of the desperate city past sweet suburban dreams and ennui. We're fast talking wife's fighting chain smoking Betty Davis, a high Sierra Idol Latino, a dead reckoning crazy blind, no one dare call crazy Liz Scott, ready to bail out of Bowie's pocket with a kiss and a smoking gun. My fun, Geronimo, let's go. 271 to 14 to 43 to the city of four deaths, to the city of intense poetry, Kent. We'll stop at Jerry's diner. You can have anything you desire. I go for the home fries and the hang poetry flyers. There's usually a poet hanging out. I believe they keep one in residence to amuse the tourists. And welcome to returning alumni. Sometimes it's a bar for the yard of animal homes, full of all their sounds. Or the waitrons, the cooks. They're the secret poets, the poets of the slut. And you're in their poem, and they're in your poem. I know, it's not too late. We'll call and ask Jake what's shaking. Roman might be in town. Maybe Major made the wager and is back from the track with the jack. I once asked Major when he was born in the year of the horse. Of course, I'll always play the straight man for the one who can do the camp town races with Buddha and has a voice like Lowell Thomas. I'm an Irishman, not a Chinaman, he told me. I was born in the year of the potato. Some say potato, some say potato. Some say Meredith goats. Some say that's a horse of a different color. It shouldn't be changed in midstream. That things are in the saddle and ride mankind. Who Gable said at Boomtown, 1940, the year Mage was born. Great thing for the race. What race? The human race. Who were the winners after all? Conquest, war, famine, death. Ah, oh, we're here at last in the home stretch on our journey to the end of the night. What? The lights are dim. The door is locked. The dining is closed. Again, the question is now, where do we take our loneliness? Jerry's is closed and the air is dead, but we are alive and I drive a getaway car. The moon is blue, anarchy's in the air. You are as cool as roses and ready to move. Geronimo, let's go. This is up, C Street. 
they used to, uh, when Irv, Irv gave this over to a couple of people and uh, they were asking to name the uh, deli, and I came up with the name C Street, uh, won $25. And then, then they went out of business. <laughs> Driven in the street by what natural grief, the moon of hunger, boredom, my dog. This life on the high wire, life in midair, life falling between the cracks into the heartless dark. Blindly I tap, 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 like some desperate telegrapher, a message to the world. I want light, I want a shining path, I want flowers of illumination, I want lightning and thunder, I want a cornucopia of light, I want a clean, well lighted place, I want a wall of light where the cool meet the hot where the underground rubs shoulders with the underworld. I want Leon Trotsky. I want C Street to be alive with light. I want the Hornby conspirators to lighten up. I want the wall of light to be a wall of art, where the hipsters and the tipsters and the junkies for all seasons wail and reason. Those were the Dow Jones, Jones, those were the no notes for news, reading the times, those poets of the night, burst in survival and crime. Those who joke and smoke cigars, while under the stars, their cars are ticketed. This is a heartbreak now, to the ticker take tales the emotional meltdown of lives turned into chopped liver, liver, the beef after beef to a not worse than death, to the baloney of the lonely. With years of earth, the wilderness will cease to lead to the promised land. As Sheldon, as Diane, as the weekend bar trackers pumped up on twilight ozone. Ask the old timers, Ben, Harry, Sid, Seymour, Jerry, go deep, go below the ego, go suburb, and say to the kid, he's looking at you, kid. It's not hunger or boredom, but loneliness that makes each face mirror. And in honor of um, the baseball season, tell Chief Wahoo the wounded knee, crazy horse. Sand Creek, Sitting Bull, Little Big Home. Whisper in his ear the trail of tears to come to Coach He's Joseph, John and make Geronimo. Let him know when his false face red Sambo with his Uncle Tomahawk grin and Pinocchio alive the nose goes. He shall rise up on the wings of eagles, dance to the drumming and dream. Not what the white man deems important, the pennant race of Fort Jacobs, but the human race, the wilderness of his own imagination, his original face. Now, for my last poem. After the race of scavenger darkness, blackbird picking at the blackened fur, the hare's foot left times four flattered in the fluji with the floy floy. Let me balance this with the day's loss, pay my respects to life and to death, and give my heart's breath to the green wood, the fallen rock, the road work ahead.